kind of the, the difference in care for the adolescent epilepsy, as well as the idea of transitional care through adolescence into adulthood. Um, so I want to start off with some basic information and basic ideas. I wasn't sure exactly how you know, diverse the group would be, but I'm just trying to talk about about 1% of the population with epilepsy, and the number is 1 in 26. I'm sure a lot of people have seen that's out a lot now. But this is something that a lot of people don't realize, and this is a, from a, a study, and basically looking at the age of people across the bottom and um, when they start having seizures. And if you look between 10 and 20 years old, this is the amount in the study that had their seizures started. So adolescence is actually one of the more common times that people start having seizures. And that's one of the reasons that we really need to focus on this group. The other reason that a lot of people don't think about, and I didn't think about until more recently, is comorbidity. So a comorbidity is when someone has two or more disorders or diseases at the same time. And we know that with epilepsy, about three quarters of people with epilepsy have some sort of comorbidity. And a lot of these are biobehavioral or psychosocial, meaning you know, um, either psych psychiatric problems, depression, anxiety, ADHD, uh, learning disabilities, autism spectrum, are all comorbidities. And um, what we found is that, and there are studies that show, if you treat the comorbidity, that actually may have even a bigger impact on someone's quality of life than even just treating the seizures. Um, so I think it's something that we haven't focused on for a long time. I think it's something we need to focus on, and, and that's one of the reasons we're, we're doing this, putting this uh, program together. And about half of adolescents um, have some sort of comorbidity. And these are some of the comorbidities we just talked about. We've got the mill. And while well, I think it was a, a, a while to design it, and I really was happy with my design, it's not really accurate because it's really more like this, because it's all over. It's, you know, it's not just adolescent, it's not just epilepsy depression, it's adolescent depression, depression with semi-anxiety and maybe sick disorder at the same time. So it's more complicated. Um, and to expect one doctor who specializes in epilepsy to do all this is, is difficult. And that's why we really need a team-based approach. So just a, a little idea is, just so people will understand. So depression, in the general population, is out of 100, uh, 100 people, 18 out of 100 will have depression. In patients with epilepsy, 36 out of 100, so twice that, actually have depression. So it's a lot more prevalent in, the, um, in patients with epilepsy. And the other interesting thing, and this is what uh, studies have shown, is that epilepsy and depression have an interesting mix. And if you have epilepsy, you have a higher chance of having depression. But also if you have depression, you have a higher chance of having epilepsy too. So it seems to, to kind of go both ways. Um, and there's still a lot of research being done on that and why, what the underlying cause may be. Um, things that we found uh, that, that may contribute to depression in epilepsy is not understanding epilepsy, not having knowledge, not having information. And I think that's one of our big focuses is education. I think education is really important. And education for the families and education for our patients. And I think for a long time, we haven't, and I think Dr. Anderson was kind of you know, talking about that, is we haven't talked to our patients as much as we should be, and we haven't been educating them as much uh, as we should. Poor family relationships is something also um, that we're working on and bringing the family together. Um, one of the things is support groups. And a lot of kids, you know, I, Dr. Moshe was asking, you said, how many people with epilepsy do you have? How many people with epilepsy do you have? Other kids like their age. Yeah. 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 not just you, you're not alone, and there are a lot of other people around that have it. It's just something that not, hasn't been talked about and that we're hoping to kind of change that. Um, and feelings of hopelessness, and I think that goes really along with the, the education too. If you feel hopeless, it's more likely to you know, bring you into depression. Anxiety is another thing that people don't talk about as much. This, I love this quote, I just randomly found it. Telling someone with anxiety to just, stop, to just calm down is like telling someone with epilepsy to just stop having a seizure. It's, it's, you know, they're both, 
can have both biological basis. They're both you know, chemical issues and, and brain issues. It's not just you know if someone's nervous. Um, and a third of people with epilepsy have anxiety as well. And if you don't treat the anxiety, you're missing a big part of what's impacting their life. This is just an interesting, um, uh, this is a, a woman who has epilepsy, and this is a, a picture that she uh, created, the art that she created, about her anxiety associated with epilepsy, which I thought was really interesting. Um, the other thing is it's not just the epilepsy, it's not just underlying depression, it's part of our fault, and part of what we're doing. And when you think about medications, our medications can do all sorts of things. They cause hair loss, they can cause, cause hair growth, they can cause weight gain, they can cause you to lose weight. They can cause you to um, have cognitive problems, cognitive dulling, problems in school. Um, they can make people sleepy. Or they can make people um, hyped up and have difficulty sleeping. Um, and then you're really cranky. There are certain medications we know definitely cause that. So all these other things that are going on, all these the comorbidities, may not just be from the patient themselves, it may be what we're giving them. And to, to treat the seizures may be causing other problems. And that's something we need to be cognizant of and think that, you know, well, maybe that's not the right medication. And even though it's treating the seizures, we may be better off on something different because of the side effects. And maybe it, it has a better side effect profile for that patient. Um, this is just a, a quick slide showing that some of the pain, most of the medications are okay as far as these are the different cognitive and, and behavioral issues, but there are some that are a little more likely than others to have some of the, the issues. But it's always important to remember that it's not everyone on the medication will have these problems. And even though a certain percentage, it's only about, about less than 20% are gonna have that, 80% um, are not. So, and a lot of those medications are very good medications to, to use and to consider, but everyone's different and um, really needs to be approached that way. ADHD is another thing. School issues, difficulties in school is very prevalent, um, and we need to work with the schools uh, as well. Um, we had our first uh, educational workshop. Um, it was uh, at the end of October, and actually, um, uh, we had someone come in and talk about the IEP, because a lot of people just don't understand what the IEP is, how to go through the IEP. And actually, Monica Jones, who was here a minute ago, was the person we brought in, and she's fantastic, and, and spent two hours talking about just the just the basics of the IEP. I mean, we did barely even like scratch the surface, um, but we're planning on doing um, more of those as well to increase the education. But ADHD is is prevalent as well, um, and 30 out of 100 adolescents, and 60 out of 100 adolescents with intractable seizures. So if you have seizures and they're not controlled, 60 out of 100 may have ADHD. And for um, <coughs> treating for treating. Um, to improve in school, you need to treat the ADHD. And a lot of people who aren't used to dealing with patients with epilepsy are afraid to use stimulants and afraid to use the anti-ADHD uh, medication because there are some older studies that, well, maybe those could make seizures worse. However, newer studies show that that may not be the case. And what we found is that treating the ADHD and improving school, it improves quality of life. You know, maybe you have a breakthrough seizure, but most of the time you don't, and that's gonna improve quality of life as well. The other thing is, in the general public, most, most, more often than not, boys are more likely to have ADHD, um, and girls aren't as uh, frequently diagnosed. Well, in, with pa patients with epilepsy, it's equal. Boys and girls are about the same. So something to kind of keep in mind. And sort of like the depression, ADHD and epilepsy also seem to kind of coexist, and people with ADHD are more likely to have epilepsy as well. Um, autism spectrum, uh, another thing, about 30 out of 100 uh, patients with epilepsy also have autism spectrum disorder. Um, and that's a whole other series of different treatments and a lot of it's um, therapies and things like that. We have a, a great autism center we work with and we share patients uh, frequently. They'll send them to us for the epilepsy issues, they'll take care of the autism issues. But again, it's, it's really important to develop this team of specialists to, to work with all the different issues. Um, intellectual disability is an, an issue that didn't quite work out. Oh wait, there we go. Um, about 40 out of 100 patients, 40% of patients with uh, epilepsy also have intellectual disability of some degree. And this makes a huge impact in school, which is the majority of their social aspects or social outlet in life is at school. And if they're having intellectual disability, maybe if they don't have an IEP yet, that can be really a big struggle. And so we need to help everybody um, take care of that. 
Um, now, as we're getting into adolescence, we're talking about women's issues. This is my wife, Kelly. Uh, Kelly actually has uh, juvenile myoclonic epilepsy and has uh, had it since she was 11. Um, and those are our kids. So Kelly was on medication during both pregnancies um, and did great, and our kids are fine. Um, and as of now, they're, they're doing well. Um, but women's issues are really important. And again, different medications, some medications are better than others. But then you start talking about hormonal changes. Things change, hormones come, and you know, sometimes seizures get worse, sometimes better, sometimes they stay the same. But it's really important to focus on that. And then there are other ways of treating uh, things like catamenial epilepsy, which is epilepsy associated with the menstrual cycle. And there are different ways with hormonal therapy that you can specifically treat that. Um, but if you're not aware of that and you're not thinking about that, uh, maybe something that's overlooked. And then things like birth control and folic acid are really important. And there's a whole host of other really important topics that we're trying to focus on that are really important to the adolescent, um, adolescent population. Um, but it all comes down to quality of life. And that's our goal. Our goal is, it, yes, our goal is seizure freedom. That, that's fantastic. But really, our goal is quality of life. We want to give our patients the best quality of life possible. We want them to enjoy life, to be able to do everything they want to do. And we need to approach it as a team. Now, just to kind of give you an idea of what we've put together, this is the new Adolescent Epilepsy Center at UCLA, and this is our team. Um, and we've brought together a bunch of people to do a bunch of different things. One of the things we started out with is, um, no, no, sorry. Um, that for every, every time patients come in, we do a bunch of screeners. And um, this is a thing that we haven't used enough, and I think people are using it more and more. But these are basic items. This is uh, one for anxiety. And then we have one for depression and one for quality of life as well. And each time um, the family comes in, the, we'll have the patient set, fill these out. And we can track over time. You know, someone may be doing fine now, and you know, months from now, maybe the anxiety starts to raise. And, and we're hoping that using these, we can kind of track this over time and see if problems start and then be able to hit the problems early before they become major issues. Um, so we've got epileptologists, myself, Dr. Matsumoto, and Dr. Rajaraman are all um, in clinic at different times to focus on the epilepsy part. We have specialized nurse practitioners um, who are also um, treating epilepsy, but also doing a lot of other things. Uh, Natalie Ziegler is in charge of our ketogenic diet program and our diet therapy program, so she works uh, with that a lot. Now, mental health, um, a topic that's talked about a lot these days. It's really um, a big issue. And something that, again, I don't think that we have focused on as much as we should. So we brought a psychiatrist in, uh, Dr. Patel, and a psychologist, Dr. Emerson, to come in and see our patients and work with them and try to determine any of these psychological issues early so that we can start treating them and then treat them together. Um, you know, the medications that we use, the anti seizure medications, antidepressant medications, anti-anxiety medications, all interact and they you know, have different um, side effects. And so having us together in the same center, basically, so we can discuss and, and come up with a, a good plan for each patient, the right combination of medications. For example, depression, you know, we need to diagnose it. So hopefully using our um, scales will help us uh, diagnose it early. And then evaluate treat treatable causes. So we have our psychologists that can sit down and maybe do some cognitive behavior therapy and kind of come up with some ideas that way. Education, again, this is a kind of a theme that comes over and over again, is educating patients that, you know, a lot of kids don't think about depression or don't realize that it's a possibility. And so if a child or an adolescent doesn't know that there's a possibility they could have depression, if it starts, they may not realize it may not think to tell anyone. So it's really important we tell our, our patients early that, you know, you may start to feel sad or feel bad that's not related to something that's going on. And if that happens, you need to let us know. And so we need to kind of keep a close eye on it and close track. So just knowing that that's a possibility is important. And cognitive behavior therapy, and then if necessary, medication management um, for any of the, uh, any of the different um, uh, depression, anxiety, and such. Um, our social worker is probably the most important part of our team. Um, and one thing we know about uh, patients with epilepsy, and this is just some research, is that there are a lot of social issues and social problems and subjects related to the stigma associated with epilepsy. These are, um, this was a study that looked at adults uh, who had epilepsy starting in, as kids. About three quarters of them as adults had issues uh, such as fewer social supports, 
they didn't have as much schooling, their employment, they were employed much less, less likely to marry and have fewer children. And so these are things we want to address early. And again, if we can help all of these different things, then maybe this number can drop down to one quarter or, or less. Um, back to stigma, and this is kind of, um, it's, it's kind of an eye-opening study, which is why I included it. But they looked at a bunch of kids and they asked them about um, what they thought about other kids with, with epilepsy. And some of the things they got, they said that they were bad at sports, I'm not quite sure where they would get that from. Um, they said they were unpopular, which may be the case in some, in some situations. People are scared of epilepsy, we know that. Some said they thought they were dishonest. I don't know why that would be. And they also, they mentioned they were without compassion. I have no idea where they would have gotten that from, but but this is just a random group of 100 teenagers. And so if some people think that, and it wasn't everybody, it was some, then this is a thing we need to change. We need to educate the public, we need to educate the schools. Um, and 20 out of the 100 um, students said that they wouldn't want to be friends with someone with epilepsy. So it's there, it's, we know it's there, and we need to educate our patients, we need to educate our families, and we need to educate the public. And we want to go into schools and start educating people at schools. Um, because you know, people don't know. I mean, my daughter's, my daughter's 10. Last year, a kid had a, a seizure at school, and everyone was freaked out except for her. And she actually went over and was talking to you know, some other kids. Oh, he's having a seizure. It's OK. You'll get the teacher. And like, she kind of took, took care of everything, you know, which I was proud of. But out of her whole school, she was the only one that like, was calm. Even the teacher was kind of like, all excited about it. And, you know, but her, because she's educated, because you know, I've talked to her about this, she knows and, and, and she was able to help. So I think the more kids who don't have epilepsy we educate is gonna help everyone who does have epilepsy. They also did studies looking at quality of life and you know, asthma, diabetes, and juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Basically, uh, people with epilepsy seem to have decreased quality of life compared to those and about the same as someone with HIV. So again, these are things we need to address with education. So some of the things we're doing with education is these are our support groups. Um, so every Thursday from 6 to 8 o'clock, um, we have Madison's our occupational therapist. She's running the team support group. Um, my wife Kelly's going to be helping her with that as well. Um, and then Amy's our social worker. She's at our booth now, and she's running the caregiver support group. So we've had two groups, about a dozen people in each group, and um, things have really been interesting. It's, it's when you get a lot of kids who don't know each other together, um, there are a lot of you know, bonding and, and you know, now I'm talking through social media and it was just really exciting to see some, some of my patients who never met with anyone with epilepsy and now like, they've got you know, BFFs with epilepsy and so they can really talk to each other about you know, what's going on at school, what they're going through um, and so they know they're not alone. We have dietitian, I mentioned the um, ketogenic diet program. Um, but we're also talking to everyone about diet and everyone about kind of overall healthy eating with epilepsy. Um, and basically looking at everyone's diet and see where we can improve things. Um, this is the Charlie Foundation for the ketogenic diet. I stole a bunch of their pictures because I thought they were really nice. And, and this, is, this is ketogenic diet appropriate food. Um, ketogenic diet is not for everybody, but for some people it's a great option. And I've had teenagers who did it um, and who were cognitively fine, who went on the ketogenic diet or the modified Atkins diet. And I've had a lot of them have some success with it. Um, admittedly, a lot of them ended up stopping it later because they just said, I can't deal with this anymore. But there are a few that stayed on it for a number of years and it really helped their seizures for a while. So things to consider. And I've said it a few times, but education. Um, and our occupational therapist kind of really taking charge. As far as I know, we're the only epilepsy center in the country that has an occupational therapist within the center. Um, I'm not sure of anyone else, but we're kind of developing the role of an occupational therapist in epilepsy. And one of the things we're focusing on is education and transition. So these are educational workshops. We're doing them every about three months or so. The, the first one was on the IEP. I think our next one is going to be about regional center, which a lot of people don't know enough about, how to get regional center and what they offer. Um, and we can skip that. Other education, I know the group uh, with the Medikids is here. These are great comic books. They kind of talk about epilepsy, teach about epilepsy. Um, we have them in our clinic for everybody. Um, and I know there are some around here you should grab. They're just great and they're good for kids. And, and I know a couple of our patients brought them to school and gave them to their friends and stuff, which was great. Um, so that was just basically kind of the idea of adolescent epilepsy and then what we're doing. But the other thing that's really important is transition. Um, and transitioning through adolescence into adult care. 
and the Child Neurology Foundation, who has a booth over here, it'd be great to go to take a look at. They developed this pro transitional program, which I think is a great start, um, and we're using some of what they've, they've talked about. And they've got these eight kind of areas of, of um, uh, importance, eight, eight steps, they call it. Um, and some interesting things, so transition takes place over several year, years, as opposed to in the past, oh, you're 18, time to go, go see an adult neuro neurologist or ortologist. No, we should be starting at the age of 12, just bringing up, bringing up the idea that this is going to happen in the future that early. Um, and this is when we really should at least start, start doing that. I mean, for the longest time, we just said, oh, we'll just keep following you and following you. And as a pediatric epileptologist, I have patients who are 26 that I just kept holding on to and holding on to because I, I couldn't find them a good place to go. And now with this program, we're starting to find you know, good people and people that match. And that's the other thing is, and I tell people about psychologists as well, you may go to a psychologist and it's not a good fit and you don't, you know, you don't really click with that, that, that person. Go see another one. And you may need to see three before you find the right person. Well, it's the same as neurologists or epileptologists. You may, the first person you meet or the same first person you have a visit with, you may not feel comfortable with them. That may not be a good fit. So you may need to try a couple of different people because this is someone hopefully you'll be with for a while. Um, these are some of the skills. So they've kind of talked about these skills. What we want to do is, is develop this into kind of a, every two years we're going to have a list of skills or a list of things we expect uh, our patients to know. Things like what their diagnosis is, what their medications are. And we just know what their medications are, and what their dose, when they're supposed to be taking it, how do they get their medications, and what if they need refills. So these are things over time. You don't expect the 12 year old to know this, but by 18, by 20, these are things that, they, that should be known, and over time, they should learn. Um, adherence, the importance of, of uh, continuing to take medication, not skipping medications, you know, allergies that they have, and then what to do in emergency, how to contact your doctor. So these are all things that we want to put together and have a, a, a a program from 12 to 18, 12 to 20, and, and teach throughout the years. And we're developing a series of videos as well that kind of um, teach about all these things, and kind of uh, talk to patients so that we're not just telling you you need to know this, we're gonna to try to help you learn it. Um, the create a transition plan, which is a lot of what we just talked about, and then review it each year. So each year we should bring the transition plan out and say, okay, you're doing this, you're doing that. This is great, this is what you need to know for the next, next visit. Um, so we discussed this a little bit as far as legal responsibility as we're getting to 18. The thought is to start even talking about this at 14. And you know, is this something like guardianship, uh, conservatorship, power of attorney? You know, these are things that a lot of people don't know about um, but need to consider, need to think about um, and start getting a plan together. And sometimes we need um, attorneys or advocates to help us with that and we're trying to connect people together. Um, the, the plan is um, also, it's a whole team approach again, and depending on the patient, every patient's different. Uh, some patients for uh, education, we need you know, to help as far as uh, getting um, help at college or getting to a, a secondary um, education. Um, but each patient is different, and really focusing on each patient and coming up with a plan for all of these different, different topics. Um, Again, we're updating it yearly, um, talking to our neurologist, and as they get older, start talking to the next neurologist about these same topics. Um, and about one to two years before it's time to transition, start working to find the adult uh, doctor, adult epileptologist, or adult neurologist. And uh, what we've tried to do, we've done a couple times, is we've sent a patient to an adult epileptologist, they had an appointment, and then they came back to see us again, and say, okay, how did that go, what do you think? and they were comfortable, they felt good about it. We talked to the adult epileptologist as well, and then they went back and saw them the next time, and they were comfortable and they stayed. But if they weren't comfortable, they could come back, okay, we're still here, you're not comfortable there, okay, we'll see you in another four months or three months, and we'll find another person for you to go to your seat. And we may have to do that a few times. Um, and then finally, the over, overlapping visits, um, and again, working with the whole team. And, it, only, it may not only be the epileptologist, but if you've been seeing a psychologist or a psychiatrist, you may need to find an adult psychiatrist or adult psychologist as well. Um, and internal medicine, we talked about that before. Um, so these are all things that taking your pediatrics team and moving it to an adult team. Um, and this really goes, the, is really talking about partnerships. And, and this is what we're developing. We're developing a network in Southern California. Um, that our center in the center but with adult neurologists, primary care physicians, psychologists, psychiatrists, gynecologists, 
we're developing a network that works together. Um, and it, so we feel comfortable. And these are all these things, because again, we mentioned that epilepsy is scary to a lot of people in the community, but even to physicians, epilepsy is scary. Um, even to adult neurologists, pediatric epilepsy is scary. So we want to get all of these um, different people comfortable with our patients. And we're going to be running a CME course at the end of uh, the spring to kind of educate them more. And the more they understand, the more they'll feel comfortable, both the pediatric and the adult people, then they'll feel more comfortable having our patients come transition to them. Uh, we also partner with uh, the Epilepsy Awareness Day, uh, the Epilepsy Foundation, uh, Care for Cure is a great organization that has um, uh, really supported a lot of our fellows. These are all the fellows in the bottom. Actually, they're all our fellows. Um, and have really uh, helped us educate more epileptologists. And there, a lot of them are um, still at UCLA, but some are down in Orange County, some are in Long Beach. Uh, Adam up top is in, in San Francisco. So with the Care for the Cure, we've been able to train more epileptologists, hopefully with the same mindset out there in the community. Um, the last thing that we're, we're working on is, is research because, you know, you said we're a big you know, research institution. And one thing of, of interest is mindfulness. And I don't know how much you know about mindfulness, but uh, it's uh, a form of meditation that really focuses on being in the present and not focusing on the past, not focusing necessarily on the future, but really being here. Um, and the Mark at UCLA uh, has done a lot of research and has a lot of programs. I've taken a number of their courses, uh, my wife has too, a couple of our other people have, and I'm sold, I think it's fantastic. And there is some evidence that in adults with epilepsy, this can be helpful in everything from decreasing seizures to um, improving depression, quality of life. And there's good evidence in adolescents with ADHD um, and I believe anxiety. What hasn't been done is adolescents with epilepsy, and that's, we're hopefully going to be running a, a, a program, running a, um, a research study in the fall and spring uh, about this to really hope, hopefully bring mindful awareness to our patients. Um, thank you. This is uh, our center, um, but any questions I can answer?
um, as soon as they become an adult, they lose out, they get kicked off the parents' insurance at a certain age, depending on what county and what state you live in. But it's pre-existent. Therefore, they, you lose your treatments, you lose your medications, you have to, the doctors will see you but for something else, not for the epilepsy. And then if you have just happen to have a seizure, then they to their convenience, then they can add you back into the system as well. So it's what a thing that we need to get addressed and to make people aware of to try to keep them on the insurances as long as possible and to find another transition. Because even as had this issue as a child growing up with my parents, I've had this issue when I got married and through drugs. I've had, I'm having this issue now with Medicare, okay. Um, and it's the same thing. I've been going through this for five decades now, and I have students that I work with on a constant basis, you know. And we're trying to explain to the principals at the schools, you cannot call every day <laughs> because they have a seizure at school. The family cannot afford it. The insurance will not cover it. You're looking to pay a thousand to seven thousand dollars for an ambulance for just for them to maybe do the test that they already know that you need to do, even though well, I know you're an epileptic so I really don't need to do the EEG because I'm needed at this time. So it kind of gets kind of confusing a little bit, but it's something that part of the program as one of the little puzzle pieces to stay in focus, mm -hmm. especially with transition piece. Yeah, so two things. One, I know I'm nowhere near smart enough to be able to know all this, and that's one thing I know I don't know about. Um, I also don't know enough about the second. That's why I brought and collected people together, because I can't know all of it. My office deals with all that for me. Anytime we have an issue, I have specialists in my office who know the, the insurances as best, you know, as, as best they can, and they're really helpful. One thing that was interesting, though, is our last, the last discussion here with Dr. Roche just left, someone mentioned that, and I don't know if it was you mentioned that, that what about, shouldn't the insurance companies actually be spearheading the um, transition? Since they're, you know, it's their patients that are transitioning from their own doctors to their own doctors, shouldn't they be taking a role in this? I think it's a great idea. I've never seen it, but it's definitely something to, that I'm going to look into and ask about. Because I think that makes, common sense wise, that makes the most sense. I mean, there they're, they're, they're should be the hub, and they should be focusing on a lot of that. You know, we should be treating patients, and they should be helping us with that. So, I, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. Um, insurance companies are, are difficult to deal with, but I think it's a fantastic idea and something we yeah, definitely need to do. Yeah, I mean, we have, our social worker helps with some of that. I, mean, I write lots of letters to schools, you know, you know that this is exactly what you said. They're going to have a seizure it's this long. If this, this this doesn't happen, don't call the, you know, the, the ambulance. And, you know, usually two or three letters later, it takes them and it's just hard. But it's a, a, a process, a long process. So I know a lot of the difficulties is, well, you know, we have a 16-year-old. What if, how much of this is normal 16-year-old behavior? Because, you know, normal 16-year-olds have issues like that. And so we, we have to understand that kids are going to have typical uh, effects. We do know certain medications are more likely to cause anxiety or depression than others. So if that's a concern, then we try to tailor our medication more towards that. Just switching medications, I don't know that that necessarily is the cause. But I think it may be the medication itself. 
And sometimes I've had cases where the medication worked fantastic. I had a girl who um, drew on my chronic epilepsy also, who was on Depakote. In third procedure, she was perfectly fine. Came to me for a second opinion, and she was miserable. She had, you know, she, her hair was coming out, she had gained weight, she was miserable at school, became depressed, but the medication was working. So, okay, well, we need to change it. So we changed it to something else, and it didn't work at first but the side effects were gone. So she actually felt better, even though she had a seizure here or there, but she was feeling better. So her quality of life improved. So then we maybe added a second medication, and then all of a sudden, like, that settled everything out, and then she's doing great. So, but it took a couple different, you know, moves, and maybe adding a supplement before we were able to kind of get everything under control. And then I have a second question. As far as the medication goes, so his experience has been that the medication will work for about three years, and then we'll start seeing underlying types of seizures. I mean, there are some that one medication is great and they, they do fine for years. Uh, other types of seizures, yeah, it, 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 medication can have a honeymoon phase. Actually, three years is pretty good. Um, I have a lot of patients at six months and, you know, they're breaking through again. Um, you know, there's an idea of cycling through medications. You know, try medications and when that happens, maybe you can go back to an older medication. The data is not great on that, honestly, as far as the research goes, but it's something that people do talk about. Um, just because you fell on medication 10 years ago, you know, because of hormones, because of the growth, everything's a little different. So that medication that didn't work back then may work now. So may need to try older medications. And then some of the new medications, the, the nice thing about the new medications is there are a couple that are brain like completely different than, you know, work in different channels, different, different mechanisms. But there are some that are similar to older medications but are better tolerated. And so maybe, you know, a medication in the past that caused real bad sickness and GI upset, there's a new version of it that, that's out that has less of the adverse effects. So trying that one may be able to control the seizure and not have the side effects before. So that's where I think the art of medicine comes in, is kind of really kind of adjusting and trying different medications and medication combinations too. Sometimes it just you pick the right combination that really will make the difference as opposed to just one or two. And then there's also, you know, things like, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've looked into it, but like, like through surgery, there's even new things. I mean, there are patients that I never considered for surgery, but now that RNS is out, that's the kind of the loop, the implanted loop uh, device, patients that were not surgical candidates, maybe, uh, because of that, and also the deep brain stimulation is another thing that we've been talking about, and patients that were not surgical candidates, maybe now. So just because you weren't a surgical candidate five years ago, you know, new technology, you may be now. So, I think that's the one thing about the transition, which is it's good and bad. I think this is a great time to kind of reevaluate, re reassess everything, which would be great for the adult neurologist when they start working to reassess it. We're trying to do it ourselves so that we can kind of hand it off, but I think it's also good to have a new set of eyes, you know, to kind of like reevaluate everything and maybe come up with some different ideas or different plans. Thank you very much. Other questions or ideas? Great one. Thank you.